Since the last issue, I had a great holiday, thank you very much for asking. I went to the black country north of Birmingham, the cradle of the Industrial Revolution a couple of hundred years ago. It was called the black country because in the daytime it was black with industrial fires belching out smoke, and at night it was red with the furnaces. The area stands on iron sandstone, coal and limestone, and that made the bloke who owned the mineral rights really rich. He had golden gates in his house. Um, that's not gold paint, that's gold. Goods from the area were sent via canals all round the world. So, subsea? That far inland? Well, all industries are cyclical, and sometimes even the transport barges stood idle. So, they temporarily sank them so they didn't have to pay mooring fees. Well, you, you don't get much more underwater than that. OK, this is a four-tonne anchor. The 16-tonne anchors for the Titanic were made just up the road. But what are these, do you think? I'll tell you at the end. Wait a sec, it's September, and time for the monthly subsea roundup. Offshore news, and one project that's going well is... I started writing about this project when it came on stream in 2010, and now I'm including the development in the video, i better learn how to pronounce it properly. So, anybody. Anybody not Scandinavian. Let's see what the internet says. Yeah. Oh, I didn't guess that. Yeah. Okay, so for those interested, it's the name of Amundsen's boat. One of the greatest pioneers in history, and he doesn't get a field named after him, but his boat does. Well, since it was installed a decade ago, the field operators, Neptune, have been looking to re-establish the semi as a low-carbon hub for nearby developments. And there have been a few. The Fenya drilling campaign started last April, and the top size module for Wintershaw DEA's Nova field was installed um, May. The most two recent candidate developments to be tied back to the platform are yeah. P1 and Duva. I think that means double something. To carry out the development, Neptune awarded Technip FMC an IEPCI. It's an acronym. Anyone? That's right. Integrated Engineering Procurement construction and installation contract and the work scope covers umbilicals, rigid flow lines and of course the subsea production system. The layout's a series of templates daisy chained together via 12 inch production lines, 4.9 inch gas lift lines and the control umbilicals. And the, in the plan the two fields are J and K templates. Yeah. P1 enjoys similar characteristics of the main field however Duva has challenges associated with high wax content, and that can potentially cause problems. If the temperature starts to fall below a threshold 39 degrees C, hot waxes entrained in the flow can start to come out of solution and potentially clog the pipe. So how do you prevent this? Well, in extreme circumstances, you can just add external energy in the form of heat, but in most cases, insulating the pipe is sufficient to keep the temperature losses within acceptable margins. Insulations measured in U values, so wet insulated lines have a U value of around 4, but in this case they required a U value of less than 1. So they chose pipe in pipe. It's a pretty well established technique and works on the same principle as double glazed windows. Double glazed windows have a U value of 3 to about 1.2 for the, for the latest um, argon filled ones. Well, in this case, the pipe in pipe corresponded to a 12-inch diameter inside pipe and an 8-inch diameter outside pipe with the annulus filled with an aerogel insulant. That's like uh, an industrial rock wall, that sort of stuff. It's a fibre. And this achieved a U-value approaching 0.7. In the plan, it was important that P1 and Duva pipelines followed the same material philosophy that governed the rest of the yeah. field. And because of reservoir chemistry, this meant employing corrosion-resistant pipelines. Hey, eh? Most fields are developed by a conventional carbon steel pipe, but sometimes the well stream is so corrosive that it requires a more resistant material such as 25CR superduplex steel pipe. Now, at one time, the entire flow line had to be fabricated from this, and it's extremely expensive. 
So, over the years, the industry sought to explore cheap alternatives. One solution is to line the internal bore of the conventional carbon steel pipe with a thin layer of 316L stainless steel. And there are two ways of doing this. One's to metallurgically bond the steel lining onto the pipe, and this clad pipe is very effective, but can be a bit on the expensive side. The cheap alternative is to use mechanically lined pipe, or MLP, and in this, the thin prefabricated anti-corrosion layer is not metallurgically, but mechanically bonded onto the, the carbon steel carrier pipe. So, mechanically lined and pipe in pipe. Not the first time, but certainly not common. It makes a pipe very stiff, in this case the stiffest ever pipe, to be reel laid. It's not so much getting the pipe onto the storage reel, but when it comes off and is fed over the rail boat's main aligner wheel, this plastically deforms the line. Normally, deformation is removed after the pipe emerges from the other side of the wheel by straighteners. These are caterpillar tracks, but the high stiffness of this pipe requires extraordinarily powerful straighteners. Technip FMC say its real lay vessel, Deep Energy, is actually the only real lay vessel in the world with enough straightening capacity to handle this. The company, however, say the keynote of the project is the ability to keep the schedule very flexible, taking advantage of the opportunities to gain a day here, week there, and the project's considerably ahead of time at the moment, unlike this video. We're five minutes in, and I've only just finished the first story. Cortez, speaking of pipelines, Cortez Subsea has laid its first ever pipeline offshore Malaysia. Most pipelines are prefabricated onshore and spooled onto more than one reels, like... The alternative is to bring the pipe stalks offshore and weld them together on the pipe lay vessel. And this is normally used for larger diameter pipe, but both are inherently expensive because they require specialist vessels, um, larger workforces to carry out the operations, particularly welding and the testing. Cortez uses a different system, the modular pipe lay system, MPS, and that's more suited to shallow water, um, shorter lengths, maybe marginal fields. So, individual pipe stalks are taken offshore, but instead of welding them, the pipes are pushed together to form metal-to-metal -metal connections. So, one end of a standard pipe is enlarged by introducing an oversized mandrel into the aperture to form a bell, and this allows the pin end of the following um, pipeline to be introduced to it. This confers a number of advantages. When two pipes are normally welded together, it's necessary to check on their ovality or ovalness to make sure the ends align within limits. But this system, however, both ends are cold worked, so the dimensions are better under control. Perhaps the main appeal using the MPS is cost reduction. Making a mechanical interface joint is considerably quicker than welding, and instead of using specialist vessel and team of welders and that, the system can be deployed from a smaller vessel of opportunity, maybe DP2, 100 metres in length, and with reduced team. Subcon. When pipelines carry high pressure materials, they can be subject to pipeline walking, rogue buckling, a pipeline end expansion. This year, Subcon presented a paper to the AOG on Perth on its pipeline clamping mattresses. And these are similar to normal mattresses, except they're designed to clamp pipelines, and this means that all the weight of the mattress is effective in generating axial friction with the seabed. So now, when locating a self elevating platform on the seabed, it's useful to see, in real time, where the legs are going to be positioned before touchdown. Yeah, a survey is normally conducted before the vessel arrives and to assure the general location is safe for deployment on the seabed's level, but the actual manoeuvring of the large platforms and the position of the legs is done blindly. So, Marine Works company Pentarosian Construction approached Dix Blue to develop a system to image the seabed for the positioning of the legs of its self-elevating platform. Xblu responded by adapting its CPIC-C Volumic 3D Sonar. Read more about it in UT3. God, I put on some weight this lockdown. This week I've been on diet and all I can think of is food. So the first thing I saw when I opened my computer the other day was something called pies. Look at this amazing image and I'll tell you all about it. The University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography is carrying out a project to monitor the loop current system, LCS, using Sonodyne's pressure-inverted echo sounders, or pies. 
loop currents are a dominant ocean circulation feature in the Gulf of Mexico, influencing a wide range of human and natural activities, from oil exploration to coastal ecosystems. However, knowledge of its underlying dynamics is limited. PIES uses an upchirp to accurately measure two-way travel time through the water column while simultaneously measuring pressure at the seabed. The pressure measurements are converted to depth to find the acoustic distance travelled from the seabed to the surface and back again. And by combining the depth of travel time, the average speed of sound in the water we calculated. After pies, the next story was Project Custard. And then I stopped smiling as I started to read it. That enormous cheesecake with the squirty cream is in fact a filter holder for microplastics. Groups such as Ocean Cleanup have been working really hard to remove the large bits of plastic in the ocean. But Dr Katsarina Pabotsava from the National Oceanography Centre has been measuring concentrations of the more latent invisible microplastics beneath the ocean surface. The research is the first to have done this across the entire Atlantic, from the UK to the Falklands. She said that up to now, scientists had a totally inadequate understanding of how microplastics enter the ocean, how they degrade, and how toxic they are in these concentrations. They filtered large volumes of seawater at three selected depths in the top 200 metres and detected and identified plastic contaminants using spectroscopic imaging techniques. The study focused on polyethylene, polypropylene and polystyrene, which are commercially the most prominent and also most littered plastic types. So, how much plastics are in the ocean? Well, scientists previously estimated the plastic percent of the ocean since 1950 was about 17 million tonnes. Work at the NOC examined just the top 200 metres and found the mass of the three most common types of invisible microplastics to be around 12 million tonnes alone. So projecting these concentrations across the whole Atlantic would give a figure nearer 200 million tonnes. Survey! I've seen quite a few multi-beam echo sounder and mobile laser scan surveys and these are always fascinating. The latest across my desk was from Unmanned Survey Solutions who were recently commissioned by Conmee Council to undertake a survey of Conmee Key Wall and bridge structures and the results of both surveys were used for scour assessment purposes. Challenges including fast flowing currents, various depths, numerous mooring buoys around and a limited operational window of only two and a half hours um, per high tide survey for locations. They used the Accession 350 USV and the survey payload consisted of a R2 Sonic 2024 multi-beam sonar, SBG Apogee Navsite INS, Carlson Merlin mobile laser scanner, Veilport SV sensors and a hack sweep high high pack ha high pack high sweep data, data data acquisition and post processing software ROVs and the biggest story is that Technip FMC has launched its new Gemini ROV in recent years big work class ROV companies have been developing vehicles forums have been working on revamping their range starting with planning to work upwards oceaneering has been concentrating on the freedom and the enovas Saipem has its hydrone, while last year SMD brought out its EV ROV. Saab CI's Leopard seems to be increasing predatory in the workspace, and earlier this year Aileron launched its great big green multi ROV. And throughout all the time, Shilling Robotics has been very quiet. The last model they brought out was the Shilling UHD3, and that was yonks ago. Well, now they've unveiled a new vehicle, more under the Technip FMC banner and they called it Gemini. I think they're reserving the Schilling brand for manipulators which are also pretty cool. I think this merits a separate video so watch this space. Well I hope you enjoyed the video. On the front I showed you two structures. Well they're permanent anchors. One's a mushroom and the other's the umbrella anchor and they're lowered to the seabed and the, sea me and the sediment migrates into the bowl and provides so uh, stability. Some permanent anchors the constantly moving vessel wraps a chain around the shaft and this gets entangled. These anchors, however, can turn on their axis. If you want to know more about subsea engineering, send me an email to john at ut-2.com and I'll put you on the mailing list of UT3 where you can see these and many more stories. And of course, a range of historical offshore images. 
and you would be doing me an enormous favour if you subscribe to this channel by pressing this little button. Thank you.